location in the suburbs. Is Levittown the same as Scarsdale? It's Tonight at Madison Square Garden, Marquette versus Virginia Tech. The Knicks will be in Detroit and the Devils in Ottawa. Mostly sunny this afternoon, highs near 60. Increasing clouds tonight, a chance of showers by sunrise. Tonight's low around 45. Mm -hmm. Chance sure of rain for tomorrow. Sure. 56 like degrees that? and sunny. Is that good? And you're still, still getting me on the mic all right? Mm -hmm. Local support for this program is provided by Atlantic Monthly Press, publisher of The Lucifer Principle, a scientific expedition into the forces of history by Howard Bloom. The Lucifer Principle is now available in bookstores everywhere. Hello, I'm Townsend Hoops, a writer of books, and you are listening to New York and Company with Leonard Lope on WNYC AM 820, New York Public Radio. On April 15, 1985, a CIA agent named Aldrich Ames made a surprise visit to the Russian embassy where he handed over an envelope addressed to the ambassador. In it was some information he says was of little value, but that he hoped would earn him enough money to pay off some debts. Eventually, he'd received nearly two and three-quarter million dollars from the KGB in exchange for top-secret intelligence that led to the deaths of America's ten best agents and compromised over 100 operations in Russia. The damage done by his treachery is still being assessed, but it's likely the CIA will need decades to recover. James Adams, who is the Washington bureau chief for the London Sunday Times and a specialist in matters of intelligence and covert warfare, joins me now on New York & Company to discuss his book on the shocking case. It's called Sellout, Aldridge Ames and the Corruption of the CIA. It's just out from Penguin Books, which brings Mr. Adams to New York & Company today. Hi. Hi. Uh, it's appropriate that a British writer tell this story. After all, you've had so much experience with Kim Philby and Guy Burgess and all of those other guys. Uh, this was our first example of that sort of high-level spying, wasn't it? Yes, the first example of a, of a mole burrowed deep within an intelligence community, of course. Uh, America, like Britain, has had other spies, the Walker Ring, for example, but they basically gave away technical secrets, signals intelligence. This was the first case of somebody working deep inside an intelligence agency for a long time, betraying everything that he laid his hands on. Although unlike Philby and Burgess and the others in Britain, this was not an ideologue. No, and the pattern of, of uh, American spies seems to have been perhaps in keeping with the society, is that they do it all for money. Uh, they tend not to do it for ideology. And ideology as a motive in the West in it, for spying on behalf of the communist countries died away, really, with the Burgess, Philby, McLean era, which was the 30s and 40s. And since then, it, it's really all been, been for cash. Well, they've done it for money, but Ames is the only one who actually made any real money. The KGB was notoriously stingy wasn't it? And it, the Walker family, the whole family, I think, earned under a million dollars for years of spying. Correct. But, of course, the Walker family were not of the same caliber. Um, Ames was a man who knew his value. The Walkers didn't. They were, uh, uh, they were petty officers. Um, they weren't, uh, if you like, senior officers within the CIA, which Ames was. He knew what he was worth, and, and he, he was giving over priceless jewels to the Russians, so they got him cheap. How long did it take British intelligence to recover from Philby, Burgess, Blunt, etc.? Well, they, they tell me that it took them 20 years or so, and you ha they had to basically not just restore morale, but go back and revisit every single thing, every single operation, every single piece of paper that any of them had handled. And it took that length of time to, to uh, restore confidence and restore the operational capability. Can we expect the same thing here? I think it's going to be, it's certainly the same extent of problem in that you're looking at uh, 20 years, maybe longer. But it's going to be different here because the, the Ames case has happened at a time of, of great ferment in American intelligence. But it's uh, also happened at a time when the the uh, country he was spying for is undergoing incredible changes in its own right. Maybe all of this information doesn't mean much. Yes, it, that is of course true, in that much of the information that he passed over doesn't mean as much as it did in the Cold War. But, but it, it, your question presupposes that 
uh, the Russians are no longer spying on America and vice versa, and that is absolutely not the case. The CIA is still very active against uh, the Russian target and the SVR, the replacement of the KGB ditto. So, uh, yes, not as much value as it might have been, but that's not actually the real issue. The issue is the fact that the CIA allowed all this to occur. It's illustrative of much bigger issues, mm -hmm. and it's those bigger issues that are coming due and, and are going to bring about a revolution. There are a lot of Aldrich Ames books coming out, and everyone has its own special quality to uh, to justify it. In your case, uh, you have exclusive access to Ames's wife Rosario. Now, do we can we consider her a trustworthy witness? No, I don't think so. Um, she, after all, was. Um, involved in the spying in the last couple of years or so before the arrest. Uh, so, no, she's not. She's got a story to, to tell. She's got a justification to try and put forward. She sees herself as a victim, but she has a perspective, and I think that it's important to reflect that. Um, Did and she I'd tell you anything that we hadn't learned in court? Oh, I think she told, told, told us a lot, yes, because she was, she was detailing the personal relationship, and in these things, it's not uh, just a story about bits of paper going back or, or people dying. It's it's the the people who died. Who were they and how how did they die? How did they live? How did they die? And it's also what makes up a traitor. It's n and it's not just the individual. It's his family. It's his relationship with his wife, his children, and all of the complexities that go into it. And I think one needs to look at it in the round like that. But she was there from the start because he was involved in. The, the divorce of his first wife at the time that he uh, started spying. Rosario was his new wife, and she claims that she had no idea for a long time. Is that possible, considering uh, that everybody else uh, looking at this case says he was about the most blatant spy we've ever seen? He was, but she was also the most unquestioning wife. And I think you have to understand the culture that she came from, uh, she was a Colombian national. She was from a sort of upper middle class family there. Um, used, by, although quite sophisticated and emancipated herself, accepted what he told her, which was, I get the money from investments. She didn't want to know the answers. She mm. didn't want to confront them. So she just accepted the cash, accepted his rather feeble excuses, and got on with uh, running up the credit card bills. You also spoke to two former CIA directors, William Webster and Bill Gates. They also claim they were unaware of what was going on. They were the directors of the CIA. Were they kept in the dark about this? Yes, and, and I think this is the most telling indictment of, of both the agency and in many aspects of the Ames case. Here you had two DCIs. Um, in Webster's case, for 18 months he was unsighted on what Ames had done. And in Gates's case, he was never fully briefed. And Ames was working in the in the heart, the most important part of the CIA, that responsible for looking after the Soviet Union. And for almost in the entire period while Ames was operating, nine years, the CIA had no effective networks operating in the Soviet Union or in Russia. Mm -hmm. And yet the heads of central intelligence didn't know. Not only did they, were they not told, they didn't even know that they weren't getting any intelligence. But this was during the Gorbachev years. Hadn't the Soviet Union become so open at this point that we really didn't need the kind of intelligence operation that we had in the past? Oh, I, I don't think that was so at all. There were, there were arguments at the time, in the, in certainly in the late 80s, where we needed to understand more, not less, because all the stability had gone. We weren't looking at a period of of uh, we know what they're going to do, they know what we're going to do, so everything's okay. It was a period of, of social and economic and political ferment. So there was a desperate need to understand what was happening. And, and the uh, American intelligence community called it wrong uh, pretty comprehensively. My guest on New York and Company is James Adams, who's written a number of books about spies and related matters. His latest is called Sellout, Aldrich Ames and the Corruption of the CIA. It's published by Viking. Uh, let's get into the whole business about the corruption of the CIA. Now, uh, there was a time when the CIA was obsessed with moles. Uh, a man named James Jesus Angleton was, thought everybody was a spy except him, and he wasn't so sure, I think, about himself. Uh, in fact, there are some people who think that he set about to destroy the CIA by being such an obsessive uh, searcher out of, of er any possible spies. Uh, you say that Aldrich Ames, in a way, could flourish because of him. 
How? Well, Angleton really did, through his paranoia that you rightly outline, he did a great deal to destroy the effectiveness of the, of the CIA, again, against the Soviet target. He spent so much time investigating everybody inside the agency, and, and sometimes it was somebody whose name began with P, other times it was uh, anyone who might have seen a particular piece of information. And there was never any evidence, any real evidence. He was just a, 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 a paranoid lunatic. And yet he ground the CIA to a halt for a number of years. Now, when Angleton was, was eventually fired by Bill Colby, there was a, a, a sense after that, this huge feeling of relief of now is a chance to rebuild, now is a chance to get back to what we're supposed to be doing. And then along comes some more betrayals, relatively short time after this rebuilding had begun. And there was a desperate, by, by Edward Lee Howard, first mm -hmm. of all, and then by Ames himself. And there was a kind of a desperate thing of, we cannot begin this again. We cannot start again to uh, reinvestigate ourselves. For anything, anything is better than that. But in this case, it must have been not all that difficult to retrace the information to Aldrich Ames, Rick Ames as he was called, uh, because there, there couldn't have been all that many people in the CIA who had access to the things that he was selling to the Soviets. Well, you'd, you'd have thought it was like that, but it wasn't really. And, and here, That's the way John le Carré would work. Well, <laughs> if only it was so easy. I think you have to also take into account the, the legacy of Angleton and the psychology of the operations directorate and the CIA. There they, they believed and still believe that they are the elite. They're the people who go out there and fight the, the secret war. They risk life and limb and so on. They simply didn't want to accept, couldn't accept, that one of their own could be a spy. In fact, they were trying to pin it on the Marine Guard at the Soviet embassy, right. or the U.S. embassy in Moscow, right. Clayton Lone Tree. Right. Did, did he ever wind up going to jail for anything that Aldrich Ames did? He did, but he, as you rightly point out, there was a uh, people who looked at Clayton Lone Tree, but Lone Tree was part of a very effective disinformation campaign run by the KGB to try and convince the Americans, who by this time were hunting for a mole, that uh, while it's not inside the CIA, it's actually here. It's a Marine Guard. No, no, it's not that. It's it's the tradecraft mistakes that people have made. Well, actually, you think this person isn't uh, alive anymore? Well, here they are. They are alive and they're still working. So there was a whole train of... Uh, trail of disinformation that was set by the KGB that was very effective because it played into the CIA's own wish to look elsewhere. Was Aldrich Ames also helped by the fact that his father had been a CIA agent? He was helped in, in getting inside the agency in the first place because there is, just as there is in, in many intelligence agencies... Uh, MI5 is the worst example of that. It really was a family affair. Absolutely. And the father to son or father to daughter or uh, and so he was brought in in that regard. But in these days, um, Ames's father was, was an alcoholic. And in these days, you would look now, because you know that fa children of alcoholics have a high risk of becoming alcoholics themselves, you would look at, at what sort of security risk Rick was and monitor that. Of course, he became an alcoholic. He was an alcoholic from a very early age. And that was never picked up inside the agency. We will also look into what he really wanted to do, be an actor, and why he wound up at the CIA, uh, how he arrived at the position he was in, and how he got away with some of the most blatant spying uh, that has ever taken place in this country. Also, the, the most terrible, I, I think only Benedict Arnold could have had a worse effect on American history. You Brits probably would have appreciated that. I'm not <laughs> sure about this one. The book is called Sellout, Aldrich Ames and the Corruption of the CIA published by Viking, and my guest is its author, James Adams. We'll be back right after this. Protesters in Albany Monday <coughs> What a pleasure it is to be asked intelligent questions. Well, Not surprising, mm. except this group was... Very unusual, as you probably know. Most all of them Republicans... <laughs> well, we are New York Public Radio, right? I'm Darrell Wells, yeah. and next yeah, time yeah, on right. New York... Well, we, actually, you know, the station is slightly Bernstein older than the BBC. Should we is that right? Taxes? Also, oh, I think six months or so. Good Lord. That's next time on New York Beat from 3 to 5 on AM820 WNY.